And welcome to Season 1, Episode 7, Can You Believe It? of Figments, The Power of Imagination on ThinkTech Hawaii. And I want to thank ThinkTech, uh, a great organization, a nonprofit organization that can use your support for letting me air ThinkTech and or air figments and share some inspiring stories. And that's what all of this is meant to do, is to entertain you for 30 minutes and inspire you in your own lives. And uh, by the way, at the end of the show, I'm going to have some exciting news about another version of Figments to appear on Alternate Week. So stay tuned for that. I have two great friends uh, with me today, wonderful people. And uh, I have to admit, one of them is married to the guy who gets all of my money on the golf course, <laughs> especially in the last three weeks. So with me are Kim Rowley and Bruce Fink. And uh, I know them through my Air Force and military connections. Kim's a physics teacher, uh, an Air Force Academy graduate, and uh, married to Ross Rowley, who gets my money. And Bruce Fink is a retired Army officer and government civilian, uh, an Army engineer. And uh, welcome, aloha. Thanks for joining me. Aloha. Thank you. you. You guys are, are great friends. Um, and you've had great lives, but sometimes things weren't always so great. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The figment that we're going to discuss in depth is recovery and how when you're faced with a really dire diagnosis, you keep that idea, the notion in your head that you're going to recover. So each of you are, each of you are both of you. I'm not an English major, I was an American general, so I don't know, but um, you both our academy graduates, and we've got pictures of you in that life as you were um, cadets, and then in the life we'll talk about when you were under treatment for various serious diseases. And that's you, Kim, and here's Bruce at West Point. Uh, by the way, I applied to both schools, and both schools laughed, by the way, and so I went to college instead. But um, you were both diagnosed in recent years, long enough for me to be a, a part of it peripherally with very serious forms of cancer. And um, yet you are here against the odds. And from talking to you, I know that you kept the notion that you'd recover. And that's what I'd like to talk about. So first of all, Kim, if you would tell me about the moment, that moment, when you were told, what were you told and how did you feel? So Fig, I was going in for a routine, really a routine, a doctor's appointment. And there was a young intern and she was doing the exam and she said, I've got to go get another doctor. And so then the next doctor, Dr. Garrett came in and he did a full exam. And then he goes, I've got to go get another doctor. And then he went in and then in came Dr. Dietrich, my onco now oncologist. And mm -hmm. he's, he introduced himself as the cancer doctor. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I was floored because I just started a brand new job. Literally the, the ink was wet on the paperwork and I was to start on Tuesday and this was Monday. And oh, I was, my. it was just shock, shock and awe. And I called my then principal and said, you know, I'll understand if you want to go a different direction. And he goes, no, we want you. So that was my, that was my moment. And I'm like, okay, I'm in this. Bruce, how about you? What was your moment? Well, I had just gone back from a trip um, through Seoul to uh, Sri Lanka, to the Maldives, where we're having an environmental conference. Hey, that's a long trip. That's Says a, a veteran trip. of that trip. That's a long trip. A very long trip. And I got back and, and wasn't feeling well and went to see my doctor and he did blood tests and said, we may have to put you in the hospital. I said, what are you talking about, doc? So they did all sorts of tests, the infectious disease folks and everybody couldn't find anything. They did a bone marrow biopsy and I came back the day before the 4th of July. 2014, and they said, you have peripheral T-cell lymphoma, PTCL. That doesn't so, sound good. No. One of my doctors called it the bad boy 
of lymphomas. Um, mm. So we had the 4th of July weekend to Google uh, PTCL, and I would encourage you not to do that because you find out all the terrible things that could happen. And Laura sent out, my wife sent out emails to everybody we knew saying, does anybody have any experience with this? She got an email back from her cousin in Houston who'd just been here on a trip, first time we'd seen her in about 20 years, and said her banker in Houston had been treated for almost the exact same thing at MD Anderson, and she encouraged us to come. So that's how the weekend ended. Uh, much better than it started. And it did either, of, probably not at the addition, initial diagnosis, but I have to ask, was there a time frame for survival on either of those moments where they said, you know, the normal time frame here is weeks, months, years? Kim? Yeah, I know. So for mine, um, they said that um, the survival rate that was for stage 3C ovarian cancer. And, mm -hmm. and I concur with Bruce, don't look up the stats because <laughs> yeah. it, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. And um, yeah, so, you know, I was going to be lucky if it was a year or 18 months. And, mm. you know, I was so not, not on board with that. Wow. Um, wow. So from what, the way you described your moments, it seems like you started looking for positives right away. Um, Bruce, I'll ask you first, but when, when did you, because I know you're, you're pretty stubborn, actually, unlike me, for example. Um, and I can see you setting your jaw and saying, okay, I'm not going to let this beat me. Did that happen right away? Or did it take a while for you to develop that figment of recovery? I would say um, when I got to MD Anderson, which was supposed to be for a three-day second opinion. And oh, by the way, that was a week later. Okay. The Monday later after uh, Fourth of July weekend, which is sort of a miracle. You don't get into MD Anderson that quickly. But miracles are good. Because of the type of cancer, they said, hey, you need to get back here as soon as you can. So the doctor examined me and looked at my white blood count, which, oh, by the way, was close to zero. Um, so on the airplane, you know, I was COVID protected back in 2014, back before, before was. COVID. And um, doctor examined me and said, okay, we're putting you in ICU for 10 days. And then I ended up staying three weeks at MD Anderson. And at the end of that, I felt like I couldn't be any place better than where I was. And that's, well, uh, that gave me confidence that I was gonna make. Kim, how about you? Did, was it instantaneous, I'm going to recover, or did it have to build like that? Well, uh, Ross and I were actually talking about this um, last night, and um, back to my experience from the Air Force Academy days, there were people at that time who thought I could never make it at the Air Force Academy. and. Um, my sister rides 500 mile bike rides and she told me early on, you know, this concept of relentless forward motion. And mm -hmm. I literally adopted that as a mantra. And I would, um, I got my chemo every Friday, worked Monday through Thursday and did it again and uh, went through that 2012. And then in 2014, when it came back again, I, you know, I'm just like, here we go again. But I, I just think you choose your attitude, and I chose positivity. Well, and one of the things we'll talk briefly about it and encourage everybody to see it. I know that you blogged uh, religiously, and and you shared your experience. And from what you've said in other conversations, that was a part of it. But the name of your blog, so people can go read it, because it's powerful. Oh, thank you. Um, it's www.ovariancancerfighter.com. And, uh, you know, I went this the first time I thought, well, I'm done and dusted. I never need to, to worry about this again. But when it came back in 2014, I felt like it was really important to share my experience mm -hmm. with other people so they could see 
you know, what I was going through and, and that it doesn't have to be a death sentence for sure. Well, wow. so I'm going to, now that we know that you have the figment of recovery, something, some things, some factors had to make it real. And I want to ask you what those factors were. I've got my list that I've shared with you, so you shouldn't be surprised. How important a role did people play? Bruce, I, you know, I'm sure your family, but what role did people play? And what would you say about that? Well, I wouldn't have made it without my wife. I mean, plain and simple. Um, to have her as a caregiver and her meticulousness, I mean, she took notes on every doctor's visit. She still does. Um, mm -hmm. There were times that um, doctors would say something, and my wife would say, well, that's not what she said three weeks ago. And they'd look at her, and, and she'd go back at her. <laughs> and so, yeah, I would say, number one, that caregiver is just absolutely essential. And then family and friends, um, you know, I had both my kids come visit. Uh, my mom came to visit. I had friends in Houston come visit. I had friends from around the country who just happened to be coming through Houston come and visit. Um, mm -hmm. That's irreplaceable. If you know somebody who's going through something like this and have the opportunity to visit them, do it. Because yeah. it's, for me, that was inspiring. And I, I think that's an area where for those who aren't directly involved, who don't have the disease or aren't in the family, sometimes it's difficult. You know, what do you say? And I've got a, a Facebook friend in an old fighter pilot script, but I don't know him. I know he's a kindred spirit from the posts in this very irreverent group of old fighter pilots, but he's facing a challenge with his wife, with very serious cancer. And I finally said, I don't know you, but here's a message um, and good luck with this fight. And I, I think every little bit helps, but I'm no expert. Kim, you are because you've lived it. Would you echo uh, what Bruce said? And is there anything you'd add? Um, oh, yeah, 100 uh, percent. Faith, family, friends, coworkers. Um, of course, you know, Ross, my husband, uh, he was the with one that money. lifted yeah, with your money. He was the one that <laughs> lifted me up when I was in the pit that, you know, for most of the time I was just forward motion, forward motion, but there was a moment uh, at Christmas time and I, I, I didn't have the energy to get up off the couch and Ross, <laughs> sorry. Ross was the one who lifted me up. You know, he used his yeah. mathematical knowledge, which I know, you know, he has, um, yep. And he, he started talking about step functions. And, you know, he was talking about, you know, when you're at the, at the top and you're getting treatment and it doesn't seem so bad, but then it gets worse and it steps down and it gets worse. And when I was at the bottom, he's like, well, this is just a step function, function and it's gonna go up. And, you know, it, it, this is the beginning of your upward recovery. And, you know, that, I'd say that was the one moment that it was just, really really hard but the prayers mm -hmm. of my congregation the, the my co-workers who donated hundreds of sick leave hours to me you know and my friends who made meals it was it was incredible yeah and it, it occurs to me as someone again who's only been on the periphery of situations like this that those caregivers need your support too uh, because they have to keep their brave face on at home and uh, and they can't do that 24 seven. And um, so regarding faith, I'm gonna throw out a hypothesis and uh, you can refute or agree. But it seems to me that faith gives you the faith to fight, that, it's, that things are not hopeless. But it also gives you the ability to accept an outcome that isn't what you want, that you might lose, that, that it is a two-sided coin that you need in either event. Yes or no? <laughs> Simple yes or no answer. Oh, I, I, oh, amen. 
Yeah, I, a good I, I adopted faith over fear. Yeah. You know, sort of like a, a fraction for engineers and Ross, the mathematician. You guys you know, are killing the poli sci major here because I'm trying to figure that out. I'll Google it. Faith over fear. Um, you've got to believe in something outside of yourself and you can't give in to your fear. You just have yeah. to believe that you're going to make it. Okay, that's a, probably a great place to take a break. And besides, it's where I told myself I'd take a break. So uh, you can take a break, grab your Kleenex if you need it. Uh, viewers, if you don't have Kleenex handy, I, well, you got sleeves, right? If you're not in Hawaii, you might have sleeves. So here's what's coming up on Figments, the power of imagination. Nick, in the next show, two weeks from now, I'm going to give my perspective on racial bias and racism in the military. And I'll have Kleenex ready. It's going to just be what I've, what I believe, uh, and I believe in our country, and I believe in equality. So tune in for that. Um, and then imagining the checkered flag, honey. I bought a race car. That's kind of self-descriptive. I have a great friend in Vietnam uh, who I worked with on U.S.-Vietnam uh, reconciliation, and we'll talk about that. And then uh, the famous Ross, who's gotten more mentions than anybody in this show. <laughs> We'll talk about how his mathematical skills helped encourage Major League Baseball to employ um, instant replay. All right, so now back to our topic at hand, recovery. You guys recovered, and, and you've been through this once because of the reoccurrence, Kim, so I'm not going to ask you first. Bruce, I'll, I'll ask you, when you go for your periodic check, how do you feel? Are you scared? Are you determined? What's the dealio? I go to a local oncologist and it mm -hmm. depends on, you know, how the tests go a month, two months. And then I'm supposed to go every year to MD Anderson. I didn't go last year because of COVID. Um, but I never have any apprehension as I look forward to those um, visits. Um, I always try to do, especially when we go to the mainland, MD Anderson, to try to visit, you know, my mom and, and other family and Laura's family and things like that. And so make it more than just about the going in for a checkup because, you know, it it could be someplace where you get bad news, but I just I never go in with that expectation. Um, I'm remembering back if I look like I'm pondering something, it's because I'm pondering something. I remember back to when my folks were both um, in their last days and my mom had throat cancer. My dad had emphysema, lifelong smokers. Stopped near the end, but not soon enough. And now that I think about it, listening to Ubers, they did that too. They, they were in the process of dying and they knew it. Uh, and their diagnoses were very dire. Um, but they never just went for treatment. In fact, they, they made a point to do everything they could. I'm not a big fan of the term bucket list, but they didn't let their lives be consumed by their disease, which was good. Kim, your thoughts on going in for the next checkup, especially having been yeah. through more bad news? Well, I think for me, one thing is that I, I realized I couldn't put life on pause and we made the trip it with uh, our good friends, Dan and Ellen, to France and really started to make that effort to, to do those things that you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. Get out there, do the traveling that you want to do. I, I just think there is that sort of feeling of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I, you know, I felt that on and off. But again, I, you just have to move forward and believe that if remember the mighty morphin power rangers and they activate i'm ready to activate my you know my network again as needed yeah uh we have a question from a viewer that is a good segue into something we're going to uh talk about because and it's very period specific if you will and the question is what advice would you give to people who got diagnosed with cancer during covid and are stuck alone at home because COVID does kind of tear at our social fabric and the social fabric was important to both of you. So Kim, I mean, that's a tough question. Yeah. I don't know if there is an answer. Yeah, 
No, I have I have some good answers. In fact, um, of course, I've had several teacher. friends read. I have friends that have reached out to me and said, my friend just got diagnosed last September, last summer. And that network, there's an ovarian cancer network and there's there's online cancer networks everywhere. We have virtual support groups for um, women's cancers that I'm part of. Um, reading blog posts, connecting on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And Zoom. That's been, it's been like the bonus of mm. all of the pandemic is that this technology, things that you never thought, thought possible, like having astronaut Susan Helms pop in for a chat are Wasn't now possible. Great? And so, yeah. right? Yes, she was amazing. Oh my gosh. And she's coming to talk to my students soon too. So oh, wow. That's exciting. But, um, yeah, so I, you know, I would suggest that get involved with those online networks. They're strong, they're powerful. Um, I've been messaging friends that are going through active chemo right now mm -hmm. and just spreading that posit positivity. And, and you know, you mentioned faith. One of my favorite Bible verses is with great power comes great response responsibility. You know, it sounds like the Spider-Man quote, but it actually comes yeah, it does, from but... the Bible, Luke 12, 48. And in, because we're survivors, we have that responsibility, I think, to pay it forward and to share and to be there that we can be helpful to people that are going through the same thing. Because you're survivors, you have the responsibility. Bruce, anything else, COVID? I would specific? agree. Um, yeah, have, um, the lymphoma, um, leukemia lymphoma society. You know, the hard part when you first get diagnosed is getting those connections with people who um, have been through it. And I've had numerous people come to me and the, the best advice that I give to everybody, no matter what, is get to the best place you can for the type of cancer you have as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. And that's not as easy during COVID, but still, especially mm. now, uh, more possible. Um, and get as much connections with people who've been through it. Ask for help. You know, to paraphrase Fig's rules, never miss the opportunity to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, because there are people out there, you just don't know them yet. And, and you have to recognize, I think, um, again, going back to my parents' experience, that um, you can have great doctors in your personal care network at home, wherever, but they don't know everything. And when my mom was diagnosed with throat cancer, he was, he was a little stubborn again. So unlike me, and, um, but he just drove and drove and drove to find an alternative approach from what his very good doctors offered him. And instead of two months, she got two years and 10 months and they were good years and 10 months. Um, I was going to ask, but I'll let the viewers ponder it instead, because I'm, I'm going to ask you more about what your current pigments are in a second. But Survivor's Guild is a real thing, and people have it. So you are the outliers. You beat the odds. However, the odds are odds for a reason. Ask the math major, right? So um, it has to be a little difficult when you run into friends or family who lost a loved one who didn't beat the odds. and. Um, so I'll let the viewer ponder that and think about what you do in either side of the situation. But let's talk about figments. What's your current figment? Bruce, we got a picture of you in a happier time post recovery, um, and you know that had to be a great moment. Yeah, I was uh, at the Honolulu Airport coming back from MD Anderson, mostly with people from my office. Where's your mask? Where's your mask? Oh. This yeah, before COVID. Yeah, but um, I, I got 800 hours of donated leave from government wow. civil servants. 800 hours, which completely covered the six months that I was out of work. You were a government civilian at the time. Let me explain for viewers who might not get that. That means his, in order to get paid, he had to take leave. Um, the government has uh, the capability of folks who can help somebody in that kind of situation by giving up their own free time and you know that's we all treasure our free time i think yeah 
and, and 800 hours is a lot of free time. So, so what's your current figment? Current figment. I've That's been, the question. Giving back. Um, I've been involved in Rotary International for 20 years. We have a sister club relationship with Hiroshima, Japan. <clears throat> Our club is the Rotary Club of Pearl Harbor. And mm -hmm. you think of it sort of like bookends in World War II. I mean, they attacked us on Pearl Harbor Day and we bombed them in Hiroshima. And, and yet we've come together, goodwill and better friendships for, for peace. And um, cool. that's a powerful thing. Um, yep. I'm involved in something called Young Life, which is a non-denominational um, group that helps mostly troubled teenagers. Um, a lot of them, you know, single parent uh, kids and, and uh, don't have a lot of chance at life. And, and we have volunteers that go in and, and help them. So uh, you've, been get, you've been given this extra time. And yeah. you're going to make the most of it by giving back. You can tell we're getting to the end of the show. And I'm, yeah. I want to give Kim a chance to talk about what your figment is right now. There you are. Great picture of a great family. Yeah. So this was us at Niagara Falls. And this was part of my renewed enthusiasm for travel, which hopefully uh -huh. we'll be able to start do doing again this summer. Of course, you know, I'm still continuing to write in the blog. I, we have a mm -hmm. local ovarian cancer support network that I'm www.ovariancancersurvivorfighter.com, right? Yes, ovariancancerfighter.com. Yes, and mm -hmm. I, I actually made sure all, all the widgets were updated. And I, I've, been, I've been focusing too on, you know, progress, not progress perfection of working on, you know, my healthy, healthy diet and um, trying to get those daily blueberries in so I can be smarter and think as, as well as Ross does. And then, um, you know, I'm continuing to teach and I, I love, love, love yeah. my students. And the same thing as Bruce said, my coworkers who didn't even know me, because this was in 2012 yeah, right. and then again in 2014. Supposed to start the next day. Yeah, both times donated uh, leave to help me out, and um, just just a huge heart and Ohana here, and you know I think if, if we have to activate the network again, we will do it and and move forward. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing your stories in such a personal way. And uh, what would Pig do? Pig would because we always cover that during figments. Um, Pig would take your lessons and your observations to have faith. And whatever faces us, there are people and things that can get us through, regardless of the outcome. So, mucho mahalo. And uh, I'll see Bruce, you on the golf course soon, and Kim, you and Ross together sometime. All right. So, thanks for watching, folks. Um, so I've, got a, I've got chicken skin again. I guess I get it about once or twice an episode. Um, we're going to be back. We, I'd love your ideas for what you'd like to have us talk about on Figments. And I'd really like you to be excited that Figments on reality will start on 24 May or thereabouts. The, the, the new every other week show at 10 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time um, is certain, but the start date, we'll see how it works out. And that's going to be two things, commentary on the events of the day in a non-political nature, because there's enough politics already. And uh, I might do some storytelling because I have some stories. So thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting Think Tech Hawaii and aloha.